and good morning. The uh, business partnership for early learning got started really in our research about eight years ago with an effort to try to understand what made an impact in terms of having kids succeed in school. The founders, including Phyllis Campbell, who's here this morning, Bob Watt, Mike McGavick, basically asked the question, what things can be done in this community that will impact children's success rate? The first stop, frankly, was to come to your offices to, for the, uh, uh, the journey that uh, the business partnership uh, took in order to eventually form the program that Kathy's talked about today involved looking at the research in our own backyard that Pat and Andy have done and to be able to, to look at and understand better the research that underlied some of the things that had been done in the parent-child home program early on. The, on behalf of the founders of, of BPEL, it's I want to say how delighted we are that the United Way program that we're going to talk about here today is going to take the BPEL program, the parent-child home program, to scale. It is a profound program that is very real and very deep. The opportunity we have in our conversation today is to follow the same journey of discovery that Bob and Phyllis and Mike had eight years ago that led to the founding five years ago of the BPEL program. So with no further ado, let's get started. And, and let me begin, Pat, with a question for you. What kind of research led you to conclude that babies and toddlers don't learn very well without interacting with people? Well, let me say first, John, that Andy and I are so happy to be here on stage with you sharing this important moment. What a wonderful launch. I think what we'll see today is a perfect match between what's coming out of the laboratory and what you're putting in place. So your question has to do with how do we know that children learn from people better than they learn from machines? So we've been doing a set of exciting experiments at the University of Washington's iLabs, Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, to test how babies learn when they're exposed to a new language early in development at about nine months uh, for the first time. It's like having Mandarin relatives come and move in for six weeks and we expose them for six, uh, 12 sessions over the six week period. So what we're seeing is that the babies learn amazingly well in live-to-live, -live, you know, live person interaction, and not so when exposed on a television or an audio tape. What we have seen in the brain measures before and after these experiences the babies have was they play on the floor with a Mandarin speaker. Their brains take up that information automatically, the sounds of the language and also the words of the language. But if you do the same thing, same dosage with television exposure, let's look at that slide, the babies will stare at the television set, and for all the world you think they're learning, but the brain measures show nothing's going on up there. Babies, <laughs> babies need people to learn, at least language, at this period in development. I think it's a very potent lesson for us. And, and something as parents that we validate yes. every day. The, uh, Andy, maybe you could comment on, on what do you mean when you say caretakers are the role models, even for the youngest children? Right, John. So we all know that we're role models for our teenagers. You and I were talking about that at the table just before here. But what's not as well appreciated is that we're also role models for our preschoolers and even our infants. Children learn from watching us. They desperately want to learn how to behave like adults and use all the interesting tools and gadgets that are around. They watch carefully what we're doing and imitate that, observe it, and put it into their own behavior. And one of the reasons I really value the parent-child home program is it incorporates this idea of role modeling and mentoring right into the program. If you look at the details of the program, it does this in two different ways. One is the, the home visitors are very well trained in talking to the parents about evidence-based methods of teaching, and they model that for the parents. There's this statement in the, in the training program about show them, don't just tell them. So they model these effective treatment programs. And the other thing they do is communicate to the parents that the children are watching them and learn from the parents. So that shows the power of imitative learning, the fact that kids are paying very close attention to what we're doing and want to become members of the culture and act like the adults are acting. When we show these videotapes to parents, it really empowers them. Parents want to do the best thing for their children, and this provides a kind of concrete example that you are, as Kathy and you said, 
the child's first and best teachers. We're role models even for our children. And although parenting can be exhausting and tiring, it helps parents realize that what they do is fundamentally important. They can help the child's success, and they are a teaching right from the child's birth. I wanted to congratulate both of you on the opening of the uh, new iLabs uh, uh, facility and the, uh, the brand new machine that you just acquired. I'm, I'm hoping you'll comment a little bit about that, but also would love to have you talk about the great new research that you've done that connects socioeconomic status to brain development. Could you maybe comment on that, Pat? Well, the match between this research and what you're doing is so very important. But let me say first that the uh, MEG Brain Imaging Center that we opened a week ago Monday, uh, that's magnetoencephalography, John, 23 right. I, letters. You don't, have I knew to, that. you don't have to spell <laughs> that. So why is an MEG machine so valuable? Uh, it, it noiselessly and harmlessly and completely safely measures brain function from birth to aging adults. Mm -hmm. And the reason brain function is so important is part of the research that we have published in the last couple of years demonstrates how important it is to understand what's going on up there, really concretely, physically in the brain. We did a study on five-year-olds looking, as you're interested in, that preparation gap, saying five-year-old before they enter school, how ready are they to learn? So in this study, we took maybe 16 different measures of the children themselves, their IQ, their cognitive skills, their social skills, and their language skills. We also took a measure of the family, socioeconomic status, which measures the education and occupation of the mother and the father. And the children were measured in an fMRI machine. We had a static snapshot of the brain focused on Broca's area. Now, Broca's area is on the left side of your brain, right in front of and on top of your left ear, and right now it should be buzzing away like crazy as you listen to me talk. So we were measuring Broca's area in the brain because it's the seat of language and literacy. Now let's look at this graph that I brought. It's a fairly complicated graph, but on the right side of the graph, you're going to see a brain. And the brain is highlighting where Broca's area is in the individual. And the graph is showing you on the horizontal the SES of the family. So as you go across, it gets higher. And the uh, vertical axis is showing you the activation of Broca's area. The surprising news is that all of the measures of the children showed that it was related to Broca's area, but the fundamental explanation for Broca's area activation came from the measure of the families. So not the measures of the kids themselves, but the measures of the families. The lower the socioeconomic status, the less active the brain was at the age of five. It's a fascinating conclusion. A Andy, can you talk a little bit about the causes? Right. Well, we think part of the cause is the difference in linguistic input that's provided from professional parents versus um, low SES parents or welfare parents. And there was a brilliant study done by Hart and Reasley that's actually quoted and talked about in the parent uh, child home program that showed that the linguistic input is stunningly different. So to put a number on it, the research shows that parents from professional, uh, uh, professional parents talk to children and provide input of over 2,000 words an hour, and for welfare parents it's something like 620 words an hour. When you multiply that up at, to say, when the child's age three, kids of professional parents have heard something like four million words in their life and children of welfare parents have heard only one million. Now that's a three million word gap. So we think that input has different, it has an impact on the brain and affects literacy later. And as Kathy said, we no longer want to think of the achievement gap as just as an achievement gap, but something like a preparation gap. This three million word gap in input is leading to the differences that Kathy showed about 20,000 words in the children's vocabulary at six years of age versus 2,000. So we believe linguistic input as well as social emotional input and cognitive input makes a difference. It really makes a difference for school success and affects reading later. My teenage sons would say they may have even heard more than that That's many right. millions of words by the time they get to be this age. That's right. <laughs> knowing, knowing what we do of this fascinating research and, and the results of the parent-child home pilot program that Kathy talked about that the Business Partnership for Early Learning uh, funded, it, it's, it's great news that United Way has decided to take this program and to make it much, much bigger. 